All right, let's see if we are live. The four realities of retirement spending that you need to know now. No. There we go. All right. We live here. We live in person. We live in person. That's why we're waiting to get uh, ramped up here. Ooh, we gotta, we gotta monetize this so I can get some of that sweet, sweet money. Sweet, sweet money from <sighs> from the left. All right, so let's go to edit video. Hey, Renee, what's going on, man? Vinyl, right on, right on. What's going on with old Renee? Eric, say que paso. Appreciate you being here, brother man. All right. I was listening to some, uh, some old Rush today from Caress of Steel. Or Caress, Caress. Um, Getty Lee, Larry Dunn from Mexico, New York. That's up by uh, Watertown, isn't it? Up that way, Potsdam. Kim, brother, Kim's from California, IA. Brother, where are you coming from? But uh, old Getty Lee, his voice, dude, back in the 70s live. <sighs> Good night. Ugh. All right, so we got this montage. Walter, hobbies in the house. All right. Kathy Charade, she ran. Where are you coming from, Kathy? Walter Hobby, not familiar with you either. So where are y'all running in from? Minnesota, Indianapolis, Yuma. All right, all right. Yuma, Arizona. All right, hold on just a second. And we're going to go to my other channel to make sure we're monopolizing that to get some that sweet, sweet money. Um, all right. Russ, California, Kansas City. <sighs> Uh, there's Daniel. All right, good, 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 good. Because we're gonna uh, Philadelphia suburbs. What uh, what suburb? Like Doylestown or something like that? Massachusetts? Land? Oh, dude. Um, I was gonna do a video on Elizabeth Warren. I'll, I might get to that tomorrow. Um, because she's such a clown. I mean, it's just not just a clown, but just a fake. I mean, we know she's a fake Indian, but she's a fake. Uh, she's fake. All right. Um. And did you all hear AOC telling Ted Cruz and uh, Josh Hawley to uh, to resign uh, because um, she didn't like what they said about, you know, not approving the Electoral College? I'm like, wait a second. 2016, 2000, and 2004, Democrats, I'm sure, who are in the Senate right now did not approve the Electoral College. It's just uh, these guys are just clowns, man. Um, it's going to be a fun two years. I tell you, it's going to be a fun two years. So uh, just, just uh, get ready. Dude, why can't I get this thing to work with me? It's uh, the next two years will be a good time. Good time had by all. It's weird because I don't think the Democrats quite realize they only have literally a one seat vote majority in the Senate and a five vote vote majority in the House, basically. And they act like they freaking they act like they're all down in a bag of chips. Um, all right. There we go. All right. Cool. So I want to start off. Uh, here we go. We're good. So I want to start off real quick, uh, just for you economists. Uh, all right, we got a number of people. Uh, this I'm going to read a little bit of this right here. Bourgeois Equality, How Ideas, Not Capital, Transform the World by Deidre McCloskey. Now, Deidre McCloskey is a professor of economics at University of Chicago, and she has a three-book. It's nuts. I haven't read it. I don't even own it, and I'm going to. I have uh, – I was able to print off the foreword, which I've been wanting to read for a while. It's been sitting there on my desk, and I just said I'm going to read it while I was eating tonight. Um, it's actually interesting about Deidre because uh, she was the first transgender person I ever heard of, to be honest with you, um, because she was transgendered. She was a man, married a, a lady with kids back in the 90s, and then became a woman uh, back before, before school to do that. And, uh, so, you know, I got respect for anybody who goes against the grant. Let's just put it that way. Um, anyone who's got the guts to freaking, you know, like, did Elton John come out in the 80s or even maybe the 70s? Anyone who's anyone who's got the guts to do that, I got respect for. I, you know, even, I mean, hell, if you want to come out as a as a commie while well, the uh, well, everybody else is coming out as a, as a capitalist, the same thing. But anyway, 
I just want to read this to you because I think I tell you, man. Um, uh, let me just read this. And this might take me. And you're like, you can leave. I don't care. I just uh, I found this to be very profound. In this third vol volume, I try to show that the massively better idea in technology and institutions, uh, not capital accumulation or institutional interventions or government policies or union organizing, were the explanation. I tried to show that massively better ideas, not capital accumulation, not unions, not government policies, were the explanation of what caused the massive growth we've had over the last three to 400 years. As a wise man put it, humans recently have invented the method of invention. The ideas, inventions of the ideas and inventions were released for the first time by new liberty and dignity for commoners expressed as the equality of the title. That is by the ideology of the European liberalism. The great oomph of liberty and dignity can be shown by contraries. The linguist Kyoko Inune uh, explains how a Western notion of individual dignity gained a certain falling in Japan, Japanese society during the 20th century, especially on the very few Japanese Christians. And yet the word, when used in the MacArthur-imposed Constitution after World War II, was misunderstood. Most Japanese still viewed their word for dignity, I can't pronounce Jenkaku, as expressing rank as in the older English plural, dignities, something like the opposite of the Western and recent idea of dignity according to everyone, equally including women. Therefore, dignity for women in Japan built into the new constitution was misunderstood as merely reaffirming the low rank of women in the Japanese hierarchy. The persisting in dignity for half the population has not been good for the Japanese economy. At a time when the old heartland of liberalism in Northwestern Europe has inched closer to its radical 18th century ideal of all men and women being created equal. The modern uh, world was not caused by capitalism, which is ancient and ubiquitous, as for example in Japan itself during the 17th century. The modern world was caused by egalitarian liberalism, which was in 1776 revolutionary. It was the most prominent at the time though still a minority view in places like the Netherlands and Britain and British North America. The great enrichment, 1800 to the present, the most surprising secular event in history, is explained by the bettering ideas springing from a new liberalism. It is recent. Some centuries before 1800, a few technological ideas had started to be borrowed by Europe from China. Uh, paper, Gunpowder, silkworm, the blast furnace. But in the 17th century onwards, and especially after 1800, the political and social ideas of liberalism shockingly extended the technological payoffs through equality of liberty and dignity in Holland, Britain, Belgium, and in the U.S. The economic historian Joel Mocker has recently chronicled the improvements in communication and in the welcoming of novelties that made for a free willing and largely egalitarian Republic of Letters after 1500, and especially after the 1600s. The outcome of such rhetorical developments was a technological explosion after 1800, which radically improved Europe's first teachers overseas. The great enrichment is not to be explained by material matters of race, class, gender, power, climate, culture, religion, genetics, geography, institutions, or nationality. On the contrary, what led to our automobiles and our voting rights, our plumbing, our primary schools was the fresh ideas out of liberalism, a new system of encouragement to betterment and a partial erosion of hierarchy. Since capital accumulation is easily supplied in response to a generally bettering idea and is not, therefore, the initiating cause. I, that's such a huge thing. Capital accumulation is easily supplied in response to a generally bettering idea and is not, therefore, the initiating cause. So the better idea gets the funds. The funds don't show up and then a better idea comes. The idea sparks itself first, and then it goes out there to fundraise. But you know, I'm going to fundraise to come up with ideas. It's crazy. The fraught C word, capitalism, does not make any appearances in, in uh, Deidre's books. The dishonored B word, bourgeois, though, appears all over the place. For example, in the titles of the three volumes I write, bourgeois was taken self-consciously into English from French, 
yet it is quite old as an English used as an adjective applying to the precisely urban middling sort I'm talking about. Employed in English from the early 18th century along the vaguer phrase that a company that eventually came to dominate, dominate the middle class. One task of the trilogy here, starting with a suitably named the bourgeois virtues, is to revalue the people of the middle class or the bourgeois, bourgeois whatever, bourgeois. The entrepreneur and the merchant, the inventor of carbon fiber materials and the contractor remodeling your bathroom, the improver of automobiles in Toyota City and the supplier of spices in New Delhi. The second volume and the third then turn to the economic, now the social intellectual history to show in detail that the ideas of the bourgeois imagined had arisen in the 18th century out of the new liberty and a new dignity accorded to ordinary people. Democracy of rights and voluntary trade and in polling booths. A democracy given commoners a voice in the church and the economy and in politics made people bold, liberating them to have a go in business. In the historical lottery, the idea of an equalizing liberty and dignity was a winning ticket and the bourgeois held it. Yet, after the failed revolutions in Europe during the hectic year of 1848, a new virulent detestation of the bourgeois infected the mass of artists, intellectuals, journalists, professionals, and bureaucrats. The clerisy as it was called by Coleridge, or on a German pattern. The German's word was clarisse, or later some German word, meaning the cultivated and reading enthusiasts for culture as against the commercial and bettering bourgeoisie. The clarisse of Germany, Britain, and especially France came to hate the merchants and manufacturers, and indeed anyone who did not admire the clarisse's books and paintings. Uh, Flaubert declared, I call bourgeois who thinks basely. He wrote to George Sand in 1867, uh, the axiom that hatred of the bourgeois is the beginning of virtue. In 1935, the liberal Dutch historian Johan Huizinga noted that the hatred had become general among the clerisy. In the 19th century, bourgeois became the most pejorative term of all particularly in the mouths of socialists and artists, and later even of fascists. How useful it would be from time to time to set up all the most common political and cultural terms in a row for reappraisal and disinfection. For instance, liberal would be restored to its original significance and freed of the emotional overtones that a century of party conflict has attached to it. To stand once again for worthy of a free man, that'd be liberal. Let's reclaim the word liberal. And bourgeois can be rid of all the negative associations with which envy and pride for which is what they were and have endowed it. Could it not once more refer to the attributes of urban life and middle class people? Such automatic sneering at the bourgeoisie, need, bourgeoisie, whatever, need to stop. It is an unattractive brand of self-hatred since most of us as owners and sellers of at least human capital are bourgeois. True, if one insists on using the word bourgeois as Sar John Paul Sartre, whatever the hell his name is, and Simone de Beauvoir used it to mean the worst and most inauthentic, inauthentic types of life in France and of town life in France, it is not going to be much of an intellectual feat to conclude that the bourgeois life leads, life leads straight to the worst and most inauthentic types of town in France, like suburbs. But I urge you to stop using the word as a term of contempt and start using it scientifically and colorlessly to mean owners and managers in town, risk takers or ward takers, bisc, big or small in their capital, disproportionately literate living by conversation. Then we can find out by actual inquiry whether or not it's virtuous to hate them. The point about that, I just, oh, what a great passage. It's not the freaking rich, the clerisy, it's the middle class, the middle class. And the freaking clowns in D.C. and the clowns in all over the media and the, the entertainment industry, they hate the middle class, man. It's truly Main Street versus Wall Street. And it's got to come back to that. And this, I tell you, I, I think about this a lot. I'm sitting there thinking, what the hell is it with both Republicans and Democrats? They just, the, the, and if you just look at any book in, in the past, the guy, the, the local doctor who come to your house was always looked on negatively. You see what I'm saying? The guy who could not just fix your car because that was a little bit too modern, but uh, you know, the, the guy, just any merchant. The merchants were looked just just negative ways. 
And it's the merchant that the tinkerer in the garage that created such wonderful explosion of wealth, prosperity, and liberty, frankly, for us. It's not the freaking scientists. It's not the clerisy. Certainly not the government bureaucrats and never mind the lobbyists. It's just middle class. And this is what I just tell you, man. I don't know if Deirdre wrote about Eisenhower's farewell address and, uh, when he left, but the, we're, we're so – Focus on this technocratic, uh, uh, just, ah, I had a guy the other day post. He goes, Josh, I studied a little bit of science. You're way over your league. You shouldn't even talk about it. I was like, what the hell is that? I don't give two craps about your study. I care about your intrigue, man. God almighty. Pull your head out of your butt and have some intrigue about what the hell's going on instead of just leaving it to the experts. What the hell is that? It's crazy. The experts according to who? Well, according to the experts, they're experts. Why? Because they self-anoint each other with PhDs. Who doesn't get into colleges? Well, it's any conservative. Conservatives can't go to college. So the experts are all in just they're, – they're just freaking – I'd say a, a negative word about circle uh, – uh, Charlie, uh, Julie, uh, Juliet. Uh, I, I won't going to say it, but I'd say they're all just taking care of each other in a circle, if you know what I'm saying. That's all they're doing. Freaking crazy, man. It's the middle class that freaking creates liberty. The middle class that creates freaking prosperity, uh, that creates an explosion of ideas. It's not the moneyed interest. It's certainly not the freaking government bureaucrats. And it's certainly not the Fauci's of the world who are sitting on their throne high and mighty who haven't seen a freaking patient in 50 years. Uh, all right, you're done. Clickbait. Um, Hunter is an artist, right on, man. <laughs> oh my goodness, man! So much stuff that just is driving me crazy about the current state of the history here. I just wish people would pull their head out of their butts and recognize to leave their freaking uh, their freedom to moneyed interest because they're high credentialed is freaking suicide. I don't give two craps. Yeah, like Bill Buckley used to say, I'd rather be governed by the first 200 names in a Boston phone book than all of the Harvard professors combined. And we just this is where Trump started the ball rolling, man. I'm telling you right now. Oh, by the way, if anyone's on YouTube, I voted for Trump. All right. I I, I didn't attend the D.C. rally, but I did vote for Trump. So just let you know. So freaking blackball me because, you know, anyone who voted for Trump is obviously a, a Nazi fascist whatever the other stuff is, an insurrection and some freaking scumbags. Um, I just, it's crazy. We, and Trump started, and maybe even a little bit of old Bernie there. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, there's a lot of overlap between the, uh, the Occupy Wall Street people uh, and uh, the Trumpster, a lot of overlap. And I just hope at some point uh, we can look beyond this false dichotomy of the freaking left versus right, which I, look, I'm guilty. I'm not going to lie to you, absolutely. And start saying, you know something, we have the money and interest up here we got the poor down here, and these guys are getting squeezed in the middle here. Now, we can argue all day long. Yes, the middle class isn't really shrinking per se, uh, there's, but they are shrinking, dudes. We are. We are get, turning our liberty over to middle to the uh, to the moneyed interest and the credentialed elite. And we got to stop that crap. There's never been a society where the credentialed elite leads to freedom for the mass. Never, ever, ever. And it'll never come. And we're moving that direction right in front of our very eyes. All right. So for all you clowns who just – look. If, uh, I, I just look. You, you don't have to be here. You don't have to be here, man. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm nuking you if you start to say clickbait because I don't care. If you are new to my channel, you don't. I don't care. If you're new to my channel, you might not want to comment. I don't care. But I'm just saying. I talk about what I talk about. Don't get here. But I am gonna talk about the Vanguard stuff. Um, I, I just I'm not. I just I'm not in the mood. When we have a whole world around us, like, oh, this could be. When I do these live streams, I do it for quite a long time. And uh, it's, it's fun for me. You don't have beer. I just don't care. But I'm sick of freaking, oh, you're not talking about what I should be talking about. It drives me up the wall. All right. I look like a 30-year-old boy. Is that my man? Bobby S. All right. Good job. All right. I spoke Cannon House right on. So uh, San Antonio. I lived in Bernie, Delaware County. All right. I've been following your weather. It's cold than I expect. It's cold down here, brother. It is cold. Um, speaking of speaking of, heard Bernie was appointed the Senate Budget Committee. 
Yes, liberals have always liberals hate the middle class. Hate the middle class. I, I don't know why, but liberals hate the middle class. Always have. Now, I will tell you, wealthy uh, Mitt Romney types uh, have also hit the middle class. The wasps. I know Mitt Romney is a Mormon, but the wasps have hated the middle class class too. And so because, yeah, give him a refund and tell him to shut up, right? right. Um, so be, I, I don't know why that is. I've never understood why the animosity towards the middle class, towards the, you know, the, the, the merchants is weird. All right, so let's go. I, but I appreciate y'all. I, I just reading this, I was like, man, I gotta share it. Um, oh, oh man, Deidre McCloskey, get her stuff. And uh, I, I tried to interview her because I was actually, I was, I, there's, there's, it's interesting to me because she came out as transgender before is cool, like I said. And I just, I was wondering, like, what, wh why? I mean, what, what caused that? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't have the slightest idea how that works. I like chicks. I'm not gay. Um, you know, I got a hot wife. And I'm proud of that. Um, how she chose me is beyond my, you know, it certainly wasn't for my money. It certainly wasn't from the way I speak. But, uh, but I, you know, I don't, so how do people become gay? I'm pretty comfortable that most people are gay because they're born like that. But how do you come like you're a dude and then you say, that's not my body? Like it's always been like that. I, I don't, I, I don't, yeah, that's right. Jake says they out, they, uh, Jake says, uh, they hate us because we have far outnumber them. Yeah. No, I think that's 100% right. And they, they know where the pitchforks. Um, anyway, I, and I want, you know, but I mean, she's huge and I'm not, and, but I'd be, I just, I always wonder like, what, what, like, did you sit there one day and you said, I'm, I'm a chick and I'm, I'm a guy, I just, how does that work? I, I can't fathom and I'm interested in it. Um, I don't like the bullying tactics from these people to that, not all of them, not all of them, but they're enough. That's for sure. But, uh, but why not, you know, why not say this is, I don't know. It just seems to me like, why not tell people instead of saying you will abide by, why not say this is what happened? I don't get why they don't, but again, not everybody. Let's just put it that way. I just, I wish it would be, I think it'd be a lot more where people could say, this is how it came to my, the realization of who I am, as opposed to this is what I choose today and you will follow. All right. So let's, uh, let's go to the Vanguard stuff. Um, so I don't offend any more other people. I, I don't care. Um, I, I do. It, it, um, uh, it's funny, man. You want clickbait? <laughs> Trust me, I know how to clickbait, and uh, and I'm very happy to do so. <laughs> All right, so this came out today. Um, no, no, the other day, Vanguard stuff, and I'll just put the link right here. And this is going to be what I use on my. Uh, oh, can I do it here? Don't ban me, bro. No doubt. No doubt. Uh, so this is the Vanguard. Uh, if I could put it on there. So there's a Vanguard thing that you can uh, you can look at. So let's uh, – am I still on there? What? Yeah. All right. Sweet. Um, all right. So there's a lot more than just – I'm just looking at the uh, impact on portfolios. Um, and you can look at the whole thing. So we're going to – I mean, because there's a lot going on here. Um Economic outlook, impact on portfolios, client conversations. So what I want to do here is uh, we're going to go to overview um, right there. Uh, for equities, high valuations and lower economic growth rates mean, uh, mean we expect lower returns over the next decade. For fixed income, lower future, uh, lower in interest rates and flatter yield curves are expected to weigh on returns for the foreseeable future. A consistent theme of persistent low inflation and low interest rates across the developed market economies uh, uh, emerging from our out economic outlook supports our view of a lower return environment. The theme affects our outlook for bond yields and therefore future bond returns. I cannot tell you how many people don't get this. Bond yields and future bond returns. Uh, people are saying, well, last year my bond stood up 9% is going to give it back. Um, I'll, I'll show you again how bonds work it's the simplest thing in the world man um and it's it's actually sad how many people are going to fall um to the idea that they're going to get nine percent raise return on bonds i just nuts but anyway uh this effect uh lower future bond so right here outlook for bond yields and therefore future bond returns are going to be low equity valuations and earnings growth and even the growth versus value debate all right so this this right here is you want to talk about clickbait it's not clickbait but i'm just saying Probability of a 10% downturn, uh, 
in 2020 in the next three years. Now, this is a uh, client's rate for 2021. Uh, I'm not sure why they put this in here. So they had a probability. I don't know what that would be for 2019, 2020. That doesn't make sense. Uh, probability corresponds to percentage of, yeah, I don't know why they're showing this for 2019 and 2020. Global equity market. Problem. Okay. Oh, I, I guess they're saying for the next three years, so 2019, 2020. I don't care what that is. All right. Uh, even with the roller coaster equity rides, uh, lower roller coaster ride equity markets have had this year. Our outlook is remarkably similar to last year's. Our expectation for lower GDP, lower trend GDP, and its impact on corporate revenue growth along with contraction and valuations has led to a guarded outlook for global equities, which we expect to return five to 7%. So global equities, they expect to get about 6%. All right. That's top line uh, over the next decade. So they're expecting global stocks to give you 6% over the next decade. We do not expect the trends that define the last decade to persist. Namely, we expect equity markets outside the U.S. to outperform largely because of lower valuations and higher dividend yield. So they're thinking, so what that means is if they're expecting a 6% on average rate of return for the next 10 years in global equities, and they expect equity markets outside the U.S. to outperform because of lower valuations and higher dividend yields, doesn't take rocket science to figure out what they think the U.S. economy is going to, U.S. markets are going to do. Um, likewise, we are expecting value stocks to outperform growth over the next de decade based on fundamental uh, assessment. A word of caution: given a strong, if not uniform, recovery in global equity prices, the sharp, the risk of a sharp downturn, defined as greater than twenty percent, remains elevated. All right. So I, again, I don't know what this, but I just want to show you something right here. Uh, go uh, having a 10% downturn is a free that happens all the time. The average uh, top to bottom on any given year is 14%, man. So having a 10% downturn, that's that's freaking nothing. That's a drop in the bucket. A 20% downturn is a uh, is a bear market. Um, and that happens about once every five years. All right. So we've had one uh, this last year, we had that one. Uh, we had Q4 of 2018. The S&P was down 19.4. So not actually officially a bear market. Uh, 2000, uh, May and June of 2015, we had a uh, like a 15% decline. And then uh, July and August of 2011, we had about another 17% decline. So we've really only had one bear market since 2009. That's it. We've had a couple of close runs, but nothing other than the one we had. And that was so fast that I just tell you right there, man, that's not his, that's, that's, that's not normal. It's not, and that, that is a cause for concern. Uh, but anyway, so a 10% downturn, that's nothing, man. 20% downturn every five years. We've only had one and that was only for 33 days this past, uh, this past year. So that is a cause for concern to some regard. Um, all right, so fixed income is good. It's not not looking good against the backdrop of lower yields. What's the? Uh, let's take a look right now. What's the uh, ten-year treasury? I think it was above one now. Um, ten-year treasury is one. Yeah, so the ten-year treasury is one point oh eight. So you're getting uh, one percent essentially to lock in money for government bonds for ten years. That is not indicative of inflation, which is interesting because we did get a report today that inflation numbers were pretty high relative to uh, previous. Um, uh, higher than would be expected, which uh, which might be a one off. I, I don't know. We we'll have to see. But that was interesting. So, uh, with a ten year treasury at one percent, that's not a threat that people are oh my, you know, jumping off a bridge because inflation. Thirty year treasury right now is at one point eight. Uh, so that's uh, you know that's climb. That's it was at. Uh, let's see, it was down to what March. It was down to one point two. Yeah, 1.215. So March 6th of 2020, the 30-year treasury was yielding only 1.215%. In fact, down July 31st is down at 1.198. So it's had a nice rise on yields, which, meant, which means the opposite of prices. So your bonds just have got hammered over the last six months or so. Still low. I mean, a 30-year treasury, locking up your money for 30 years, less than 2%. Eesh. 
that's that's uh, that's still ugly. Um, anyway, so the revised downward from uh, last year's pro projections to basically 075 percent to 1.75. So that's their expectation for uh, for bonds. That's bonds across the board, not just government bonds. So basically, you know, it's at 1.35. That's what they're saying. So their their outlook for the next decade on bonds is 1.35, amigos. Eesh. Expected returns for non-U.S. bonds are marginally lower than those for U.S. bonds, given the relatively lower yields in non-U.S. developed markets, which is why you shouldn't have any international bonds. It makes no sense to have any international bonds. Get the hell out of them. There's no, there's no benefit there. Um, I, I just there's only risk and more risk and more risk. So don't there's no reason to own international bonds. We can make an argument for international stocks, but international bonds are a big fat nothing burger. Don't do it. Uh, within the U.S. aggregate bond markets, investors are still expected to be fairly uh, compensated for assuming credit risk, which is consistent with our expectation for broad U.S. Uh, bonds uh, outperforming treasuries by 1% on an annualized basis. So if we're going to get 1% on broad corporate bonds, uh, more than a 10-year treasury, basically you're going to get a double your yield on a uh, on a 10-year treasury with a corporate bond. It's still 1% to 2%. Wow, that's that's fantastic. 2%. Well, I'm telling you, that <laughs> uh, don't bank that yet because I'm going to show you the negative here has come down. While future returns for fixed income look low, the recent crisis has reaffirmed the diversification role they play. Man, I'm not so sure about that, did it? The treasury market got killed too, man. So I'm not so sure that the diversification showed itself at all with bonds. I, I don't think it did. Uh, certainly not international bonds. All right, so right here, return projection, U.S. equities. Uh, so we can see about 4.7% is what they're expecting. 4.7 on U.S. equities. But growth is 5.8. U.S. Uh, growth is 2.1. So you see a huge difference between what they're expecting on growth versus value. So, I mean, value is 5.8. Value stocks, high dividend yields, low P.E. ratios, low price to book. That's how you usually ascertain a value stock. VTV, that would be the, the, the value index that I own, my biggest holding by far is VTV. And uh, let's just take a gander of what that guy's been doing. I, I really don't check probably, I don't know, once every, hell, once every two weeks or something like that. Uh, VTV is at uh, 123 right now, basically. Um, yeah, still got yield of uh, 255. So VTV still looks pretty good, in my opinion. I, I'm not sure what the, so that has, that has jumped from 122 at the, uh, is, yeah, I mean, it's jumped about 20, I mean, hell, 20% in the last couple of months alone. So VTV looks pretty good. Looks like it had a nice little run. Let's look at VUG, which is the growth index. Um, uh, and that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of uh, plugging along at, uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't really done much. It hasn't done badly, but just the last you know, three months has definitely been a value. Uh, value has outplayed uh, growth by far in the last couple of months. Um, and then uh, VUG only has a, uh, a yield of 0.66. So basically there's a four, a 400 percent more of a yield for VTV than there is for VUG. Um, and I, I just uh, the PE ratio on VTV, we can look at Vanguard to see here in just a second, but it's going to be ugly for VUG. I, anyway, just going back to Vanguard, uh, they're expecting a five, we'll just say for simplicity, five and a half percent rate of return for value stocks over the next 10 years. And essentially a 2% rate of return for growth stocks over the next 10 years. Um, take it for what it is. Uh, that's, uh, and so we're going to adjust these in the software uh, for U.S. equities <laughs> at Right Capital. I, I, I adjust them every every time Vanguard releases their new year uh, thing. I, I change it. So we're going to adjust it to 4.7 for equities. Woo! That's going to be fun. Um I hate to do it, man, but I got it. All right, so now we got U.S. global equities. Um, they're, you're accounting for 8% uh, without the U.S. That, that seems, I don't know. Uh, so they're, well, I'm going to go with it. I'll put 8%. Ah, uh, man. So they're calling for 47 on U.S. stocks and almost, you know, not quite double that, but significantly higher on, on, uh, on global stocks. Well, I'll, I'm going to put it in the software. I mean, I go by what Vanguard says. That's uh, that's pretty significant, man. Um, 
What happened to this right here? We expect, uh, all right, so let's see. Our expert, uh, global, okay, so this is global equities, which can and consist of US. That's not X US. So, just real quick, guys, if you guys are looking at uh, stuff, global equities includes the US, unless it says X US. That means excluding the United States. So, what's happening here is uh, this could be kind of confusing if you're not conscious of this. They're saying global equity. So you might inherently think foreign equities uh, ex explicitly. It's not. It's, this is global with the U.S. So they're basically saying 6% a year for, for stocks across the board. That 6% a year will be comprised of 4.7 uh, from U.S. stocks and basically 8% um, uh, from global stock, from, ex, from foreign stocks, essentially. And that's where they're getting their essentially 6%. Yeah. Um, I might just actually, I think what I'm just going to do, I'm just going to put 6% for U.S. stocks, uh, for stocks, to be honest with you. I'll split the difference, just put 6% for stocks. There, there's no way, I mean, as people want to say, well, this, that, you know, this stock, that stock, this fund, that fund, it's just, it's. there's no way, no one knows anything. A 6% rate of return for stocks sounds pretty uh, safe for me. Right now, I got stocks at six and a half. So we're going to reduce our stocks by one half, 1% 1 from 6.5 to six. All right. So just if you're in the right capital software, it might look uglier today than what it did last year because Vanguard had a six and a half. We're going to reduce it to six. Um, their bonds are. Uh, oh, man, that's. Uh, uh, here we go. Aggregate bonds. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Ugh, what's that? One and a quarter. Man, that's a pretty significant drop from my using. I'm gonna do it, man. I change it every year. I gotta, I gotta stay consistent. Woo, that's painful to see. So stocks are gonna drop from six and a half to six. Bonds are gonna drop from two to one and a quarter. Hey. Uh, inflation though will drop from two. I'm using two right now to uh, what's that? Uh, one and a half. So that's a one point four five. So that's a saving grace. Um, so before I was using it, so actually let me get my trusty calculator. I was using six and a half on stocks minus 2% on inflation. That's 4% net. Now I'm using 6% on stocks minus, uh, one and a half on inflation. That's, uh, oops. That's four and a half percent net. So because inflation is so low, you've increased your, your net rate of return actually. So that's good. So the, the top line returns are gonna look ugly, but when we factor in inflation dropping significantly by 75 basis points, um, that's, that's good, man, that's good. Um, we'll see what the trustees report say for social security. I, I can almost assure you that's gonna drop from 2.4 for cost of living adjustments to two. I haven't seen the updated report yet. I don't think they pr produce that until March, I believe. Um, and then we'll see what the trustees report says for Medicare. I got a sneaky suspicion that might be painful to, to witness, but we will see. But anyway, these will be going in here shortly. So we're going to change inflation. We're going to change U.S. Sto uh, uh, stocks and we're going to change bonds. It looks like it's going to net uh, to you, though. It'll net you. Uh, it'll net benefit to you because uh, inflation will be significantly reduced, even though stocks are kind of reduced and bonds are significantly reduced. Um it still will be uh, the bonds won't look bonds will be negative the negative yield on bonds yeah right there man so if you take you know one point uh, what's that one point uh, three five i guess on uh your your projections on bonds we subtract out one point uh four five on stocks yeah so it's, the bonds will give you a negative return Stocks will increase your return net. Bonds will give you a lower return uh, net because inflation is uh, higher than your bond rate of return. Um, and that's aggregate bonds. That's government bonds and uh, corporate bonds as well. If you're only getting two and a half to three and a half uh, percent on high yield corporate bonds, drop them. There's no reason to have high yield corporate bonds if you're only getting that because you could get freaking a dividend of VTV at two and a half right alone with the upside of dividend stocks. So there's no reason to own junk bonds uh, if you're only getting roughly two and a half. And I can get a two and a half percent dividend on stocks. It doesn't make any sense. All right. 
That's uh, that's interesting. So let's see what they say to help your clients. And again, you all have access to this um, if you want it, and you should. Um, you should save it. You should download this and save it so you can refer back to it for future use. Um, prepare your clients for the changing economy. Uh, your clients wonder how these factors of a uh, global economy, Sniffy Joe or Steely Joe, COVID-19, uh, when it comes to the global economy and markets, adopting a proactive approach, the Vanguard advocates a three A's behavioral coaching approach. Assess the situation. How are you feeling, clients? You feeling okay? Address the situation. Uh, explain to clients that worries about the global economy and the markets are common. They're common. And share resources that speak to their concerns. It may be helpful to help them focus on their long-term goals. Remind clients that two major elements of wise investing are knowing what they can and can't control. It's kind of like going to an AA meeting. Uh, audit the engagements. Evaluate clients' behaviors. All right. Uh, understand the importance of planning for the long term and do clients opt to stay the course? Okay, whatever. Um, ooh, let's see their model portfolios. Let's see what their details on their model portfolios are. Uh, oh, I got to log in. I got to register. I thought it was registered. Let's see if this. Ah, shoot. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Okay. I'm sure we can find those. But uh, anyway, so there you go, friends. Good stuff. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll see what you all think about that. Um, uh, CB says I have uh, V Dig X in my Roth. Yep. I uh, I do too. Not in my Roth, but I uh, I do have V uh, that. Uh, let's see. All right, let's keep looking. Southern California today, 75 degrees. Yeah, but then you got to deal with Governor Gruesome. Who wants to deal with that guy? Um, actually, I just talked to a client the other day, and they, they've been in California for many moons. They love it there. They're going to live in a condo. They're not living high on the hog. And that's, that's, that's the thing. Other than, you know, you have no, uh, no rights uh, living in California. I mean, it's not the worst thing that ever happened. You know what I'm saying? I, I would never, I'll never step into California, but uh, you know, I don't blame them. They're like, look, we like the, you know, we don't get too hot. We don't get too cold. Um, they're going to put solar panels on their condo. And so that makes sense, man. So you don't have a huge need for heat, a huge need for uh, AC, um, you know, a couple of minutes from the beach, you know, you're not paying much in income tax. That's not a bad deal. Uh, John Roberts is back. John Roberts, you're supposed to be in uh, taking care of uh, Supreme Court stuff. Um, so S &P, so Justin says S&P versus NASDAQ long-term for young investor. I'd, I'd go with the S&P. Uh, Justin said he left V digs for SCHD. That's a Schwab something, Schwab dividend. VTI crew, raise up, raise the roof, VTI. Uh, what are my top three funds for Roth and for traditional IRAs? Um, I mean, for I, as I say all the time, if you're going to have REITs, you'd probably want those in a Roth for sure. Uh, if you're going to have any dividend funds, you want that in a Roth for sure. So I own I own VDIGX, I own VTV, which is my biggest holding, and I own uh, VTI VDIGX VTV, and I own VTI. Uh, that's the total stock index and uh, VBK is a VBK. Yeah. So those are my four funds and I got a hundred shares of Exxon. I saw that Intel is tearing it up, man. We just did it. We just talked about Intel the other day. I should have bought some of that puppy. I just totally forgot. Uh, Intel. Oh my God. Intel's up 7% today. Did you listen to me? I told you by Intel. Oh my, look at that. Look at that. Jags. Look at that. Damn, man. Intel is up 10. Was at 46 uh, December 22nd, and now it's at 57. So 10 divided by 46 is what? 10 divided by 46. You would have made 22% on your money in freaking, what, three weeks' time. You know why? Because I didn't buy it. If I would have bought that puppy, it would have gone down 22% in three weeks' time. You know it. 
damn, what's uh tell me Cisco isn't tearing up. What what's what's the motivation behind Intel tearing up? Cisco. Oh, cheese, Louise and Swiss cheese. Yeah, Cisco. All right. Eh, Cisco hasn't done anything. Why? That's interesting. So Cisco hasn't done anything, but why is Intel tearing up, man? And what? What? Uh, oh, they got CEO change. Is that what's going on? Ah! What's Exxon doing? My man, uh, Doug sent me an article on Exxon. Exxon's up one percent today. Damn! Look at Exxon, boys. Everyone's saying Scanlon, you're a big sucker for buying Exxon. That's up to forty-eight bucks. Ooh, Exxon's got PE of 62. I might have to offload that and just take my gains. Yeah, I, I, I might have to offload that and just take my gains. A PE ratio of 62, that's that's too high. Still got a nice fat dividend yield, but uh, I might just get out of there where they're going good and buy some Cisco. All right. Um, it's nice to actually make money in the stock market for once. I always lose, man. I'm such a loser when it comes to stocks. Um uh, I, I, I never should – I should always just stay VTI if you know it. Uh, let's see. Low interest rates and muted growth actually work real well for non-mortgage REITs. Non-mortgage REITs. Uh, what about junk bonds? Oh, we just, I think we, we did talk about junk bonds. I wouldn't touch the 10-foot pole, man. I mean, why take the risk on junk bonds, which have close to the volatility of stocks, but there's no upside? I mean, you're getting, what, three, three and a half? Just buy the stock. Buy the stock. Uh, what's up, Brady? BLM versus MAGA odds. Okay, <laughs> I thought you were asking about a stock, man. Uh, I, I, is this are you uh, are you on Clay Travis's website there, Handyman? So Handyman is pushing a DraftKings or FanDuel because I every time I listen to Clay Travis, he goes you go to hey, hey look everybody, you all look, come here, whoa. Oh, come here. Come here. All right. You guys haven't seen him for a while. Can you say, hey, they just got back from a walk, it looks like. Remember the, hey, oh, 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 geez, geez. ouch. Remember Finn and, uh, that, that's just your dad, Pablo. Ah. All right, come here, Pablo. And here's Pablo. Oh, oh. hey. Hi, Finny. You want to see him? Hi. <laughs> What's up, big boy? Yeah, he's a good boy. Yeah, I love you guys. Love you. Wanna go play? Wanna go play? All right, here you guys go. Go play, play, play. Wait, hey, place. Place, Pablo, place. Place, Danny, place. Good boys. Place. No, place. <laughs> you saw that, didn't you? <laughs> So Finny's like a puppy. He's like 8,000 pounds Well, compared to Pablo. And Pablo's like an old man now. Pablo's like, get off my yard. And, uh, and Finny's like, <laughs> he's just, oh, my goodness, man. And Finny just loves, he's like, Pablo, play. Pablo, play. Pablo, play. Pablo, play. And Pablo's like, dude, I'm trying to chill. Get out of my space. And Finny's like, no, play, 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 play. And after like 25 minutes of doing that, Pablo finally goes, rrr, 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 and people oh. So, oh my goodness, this is the funniest thing in the world. Oh. <laughs> All right, so uh, any difference between Roth and traditional? Um, let's see here. Six to seven percent under the great reset. Okay. Favorite Vanguard for Roth, please. Talk about that. Uh, I'm 30. So my man on handyman is 33% of his Roth on his Roth is here. Anyone else thinking XOM over VTI? Uh, XOM over VTI. What? That's uh, <laughs> you can't make that. I mean, what? <laughs> uh, you don't see an odd comparison there. Whew. Um, uh, let's see. There's a stock rotation. Cute says there's a uh, stock rotation going on. International stocks. Are international stocks moving the the uh, the ball there? 
I haven't paid any attention. Small cap value and energy stocks are winning the past two to three months. Really? Energy stocks with freaking Steely Joe coming in? Ah, oh, man. I just posted some stuff. Uh, I don't know if I post on YouTube. I did post it on my MeWe account. And if you're not on MeWe, you should be because uh, Facebook sucks. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, talk about the Japanese energy crisis and whatnot. And uh, I just, it's going to get worse, dude. In fact, my man there, Hemet Sunshine. In California, hope you don't need any electricity anytime soon because uh, they're shutting everything down, shutting everything down, man. And uh, <laughs> no nuclear, no hydro, no dirty coal, no natural gas. So if you're needing some electricity and then they're going to mandate EVs, uh, the whole thing is just we are living in fantasy land, fantasy land run by the left. It's uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Uh, but anyway, this small cap uh, value. Ta- I did not. I don't know that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I like to see the, uh, the rotation. Uh, and remember, um, there is some called momentum. I mean, momentum is a trade. I don't trade. I actually buy. Uh, but at the end of the day, usually you want to uh, you know cut your losers and ride your winners. And if small cap is taken off, well, you might want to get more in there. Uh, you know, obviously, just uh, just buy the VTI or buy uh, um, you know, or or if you want to go heavy. You know, take some profits off the growth side of your portfolio and, and put it into the value side. That makes sense. And we've had five years of significant growth dominance over value. I'm just telling you, man. And then the late night, I just I'll say this to a blue in the face: is it 95 to 2000 value got smoked by stuff by growth? All right, no one wanted value. No one wanted dividends. As old fogey, good time rock and roll. I read the other day about James Glassman saying. Uh, the the metrics are old. No one uses uh, price earnings ratios, dividend yields anymore. And then lo and behold, kaboom, kabing, kabunk. Uh, after that, the, the aughts, the dividends uh, saved the day for stockholders. That's all there is to it. Uh, the teens, exact opposite. It just you know it just goes like that. Unfortunately, it's completely random. We don't know when the cycle is going to change, but it seems like there's some uh, opportunity there right now. Uh, All right. If global uh, inflation is always a, yeah. No, I actually uh, let's take a look at that article I saw on inflation. That was uh, that was kind of concerning there. So we're gonna go to F Trust portfolios, and you know, you know me, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I tried to be. Uh, all right, hold on a sec. Let's. Uh, I got this rush song in my head, the necromancer that I, I uh, shared you guys uh, today. Oh, the old rush, dude. Good oh, my. All right, uh, Moody's re- uh, Moody's reported that global speculative grade default rates at a six point six in December uh, puts the average default rate at four point two. Its baseline scenario sees a default rate peaking at 7.5% in March before dropping to 47 by December 2021. Uh, Moody's recorded 209 defaults in 2020, nearly double the defaults in 2019. Uh, the U.S. speculative grade default rate stood at 8.4% in December, uh, sees it going about 9.1%. All right, so basically uh, Moody's is, looks like the, uh, the default rate on – uh, global speculative grade, I'm presuming that junk bonds, uh, is, is significantly higher and will be higher throughout 2021. So there you go. Um, don't buy junk bonds. If you got them, I don't know. what I literally have no idea what junk bonds did last year. I would. I don't think it's worth owning. All right, so let's. Uh, we're going to go to commentaries right here. We want to talk about inflation. Uh they stand to feed right there. Uh, that that is of interest to me. That's four point uh, forty point four percent. The CPI in December. That's uh, that's pretty significant. That's a pretty significant jump. Consumer prices continue to trend higher. That started back in June and ended twenty twenty with prices up one point four percent. So we had consumer prices up of one point four, which is not high. Uh, but while the declines of March through May held down the full year price changes, movement from May has been pronounced up at 4.1. So 
the significant first quarter into uh, the latter part of the second quarter knocked everything down significantly. Since then, uh, it's been pretty significant on the upside. So 4.1 on the up after being down for basically the first part of the year. Uh, in other words, inflation since the early shutdown months have been running well above the Reserve uh, Federal Reserve inflation rate of two. This stands to start contracts the annualized decline of 2.4 earlier this year. All right. However, don't expect this change uh, this to change the Fed's plan to keep short-term rates near zero for the foreseeable future. It will take months for years ago comparisons to reach and then exceed the two percent target and even longer before the labor market has healed to the point the Fed begins to seriously move higher. Still, the recent bur burst of inflation hints at the impact of massive, massive 24.4% increase in the money supply of M2 uh, as uh, supply chains continue to recover. The typically volatile food and energy sectors played a significant role in December as energy prices rose 4%, led by an 8.4% jump in the gasoline. Eh, I'd, I'd rather prefer to strip out that because uh, that's so volatile. But so if we do strip it out, the uh, the core prices rose a more modest 0.1%. Um, that's not that big a deal. So if you don't take, so basically gasoline is what caused that increase um, in inflation right there. Um, gasoline. So eh, I don't know. Is that a one-time thing? Well, uh, let's see. However, underlying fundamentals uh, point to a higher risk of rising inflation than after the 2008 recession. Uh, the coronavirus response to the pandemic is the first recession on record where personal income has increased due to government stimulus checks and boosted unemployment insurance that replaced more than 100 percent of lost wages. Meanwhile, measures like in debt. Let's see. I mean, let's read this. All right. All right. So he's saying the. Uh, this is the first time in history of the recession we've actually had an increase in personal income. Why? Uh, because of government stimulus check and boosted unemployment insurance replaced more than 100% of lost wages for many workers. Well, that, I, I mean, first of all, it's UBI, 100% right, UBI. Second of all, that can't keep going on. So if the cause of inflation is because we, we never went down because of stimulus checks and uh, unemployment insurance, uh that's not a long-term inflationary uh that, that that's that's fake i mean that's literally just i mean that's literally fake you can print it only so long before it, you just can't i mean you can use mmt we're, we're using mmt right now i mean even the mmt advocates stephanie kelton and uh Masha, I think is his name even they say you can't keep using mmt at some point you are going to have inflation uh, so anyway, um, I wonder if the Democrats, now that they're going to be in charge, I wonder if they're going to try to have unemployment benefits for forever, like they typically want to do. Um, it'll be interesting to see because it's easy to blame Bush or Trump. You know, they don't care about the employment of uh, you know unemployment, but uh, once they're in charge, they're going to have to come to the conclusion that at some point you got to make people go back to work, man. You can't pay people to sit at home. At least you can't pay people 100% of what they were making when they were working. That's that's uh, that's not good. All right. Uh, the mismatch between supply and demand will eventually mean too many dollars chasing too few goods. I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear him saying that. Uh, it's not a it's not a permanent uh, – you're not permanently getting that 100% lost wages. I, I don't get why that's weird to me. Uh, additional stimulus spending as a Democrat secure control of the Senate. That said, it's clear the economic recovery is on the way. The worst economic quarter since the post-World War II is behind us. And the question is, how quickly can we get back to normal? Um, I still, I, I will, I'm still stunned that Trump did not see this. And it cost him his election, man. It cost him the election. Regardless of what you want to say about the vote, at the end of the day, it, it, he, he, <laughs> By allowing the panic of coronavirus, it allowed the mail-in ballots, which allowed it to be however you want to say, right or wrong, I don't care. But if we did not have the massive mail amount of mail-in ballots, Trump would have got reelected to the landslide. It's just a fact. You could say, well, the, he still got reelected in the landslide. Well, he didn't because he's not going to be in office. Uh, and he allowed what happened to happen because of his scare and listen to Fauci. And you got, I, I tell you, man, you got to blame Trump or Pence. You got to blame them both for listening to these clowns and not seeing 
that Fauci was a freaking Democratic lackey going back to Hillary Clinton days. We got, I did an article, the political uh, Anthony Fauci. I, did, I read an article back in February. People hated me on that because they all loved him. I said, Fauci is a Hillary ass kisser. And here is the evidence of that. And everyone's like, ah, oh, no. And I said, like, dude, well, how does Trump not see this? As I, when I said it back then, the most frustrating thing in my, in my, I tell you, man, for all the accolades Trump gets as being a negotiator and all that, and uh, I just, how did you fall for this? Could you not see that a closing of the economy, and on top of that, a massive amount of mail-in ballots, which were not going to be checked for signatures, which is what happened here in Georgia, how could you not see that? It's, I don't know. it's crazy. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, the dotted line is the probability of normal year. The, okay, we're still talking about Vanguard stuff. Yep. If you're accumulating, I don't know how you have bonds if you're still accumulating. I just don't know, man. Uh, no, it's annual. So adrenaline junkie, 0. 0.75 over 10 years is annualized. It's annualized. So it's going to be uh, uh, 0. 0.75 each and every year. Uh, anyone actually max out the Roth by February? Yeah, sweet, man. Uh, after 2020, you should be expecting. Ooh, interesting. What's your take on that, Mina? What would be all right? Infl high inflation, higher interest rates would be a relatively low grade of surprise. Yeah, I don't think we're not having higher interest rates at the same time soon. I mean, we might have higher interest rates because he, the market demands it. I don't think not the the Fed's not going to demand it. No way. Um, but anyway, that, that's ah, come on, that's weak sauce. You said there should be surprise of some sort. Well, your surprise got to be more than inflation, and higher interest rates. Give us something to chomp on, man. Something I'd be surprised if I'm not surprised what happens. 20 so remember, someone had posted this meme, uh, uh, 2020 was bad, but now he's legal, so 2021 is going to be worse or something like that. Or 20 now that 2021 can is legal to drink, it's going to be this is going to be crazy or something like that. I thought that's kind of funny. You know, because we went from 20 to 21, it's going to be bad. Now we got the balls of Jim and freaking Jack and freaking Sierra Nevada and pints of Guinness. Woo wee! Some black and tans with bass and uh, uh, bass on the bottom and Guinness on top. Mm mm mm. Um. All right, so let's hear what you think. If you guys have thoughts, what would be the surprise in 2021? I think so. Let's uh, just curious what your thoughts are. I think that the, are they still going to go after Trump when he's out of office? Um, I hope they do. Uh, and the reason I hope they do is because that is going to waste a lot of momentum um, that uh, can't be used to, to you know, put more socialism on us. And Trump has the, the chutzpah. Is it chutzpah? Whatever the truth by, whatever the hell it is, he's got the the balls essentially to, and he's got the money to fight back uh, with lawyers that you know. Hopefully, he can will defend him. Unlike uh, the parlor lawyers, or unlike the Trump lawyers in uh, in Pennsylvania, freaking scumbags. But uh, he'll be able to pay enough enough money to lawyers to defend him. Uh, when I, I hope they waste a lot of energy on going after Trump. I really, really do. And it'll get the, the rest of the MAGA people fired up. Uh, we have 10 Republicans today who voted to impeach. Uh, Liz Cheney, I was to say I was stunned. Is, I'm not stunned anymore. I was, I was, uh, when I first heard that she was a, a never Trumper, I was like, Liz Cheney, I always kind of liked her, but uh, she can kiss my big fat behind. Uh, Kidzinger from Illinois, he's always a scumbag. Um, the guy who took Justin Amash's seat up in Michigan, and then Fred Upton. I, I, oh. I was like, Fred Upton's still around? How did that? Man, that guy, Clown Central, man. I, it's, uh, anyway, so 10 of the 215, 210 GOP people we have voted to impeach Trump. I couldn't believe it. D Democrats never do that, man. It's nuts. Um, I'm still surprised that not one GOP voted for Obama Care. or the Clinton tax increases of, two, of 1993. Not one Republican voted for that. Uh, or Obamacare. That, I was still stunned by that, to be honest with you. Um, so I'm not sure what you know Liz Cheney is trying to do by uh, you know be on the impeachment Trump side. I, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I, I know at the end of the day they're trying to draw a line between 
the never Trumpers and the regular MAGA people. It's weird to me because you know never Trumpers are are nothing. Did you hear what's going on with the Lincoln Project? The founder John Weaver. <laughs> Do yourself a favor, do some research on the controversy surrounding John Weaver. And it won't surprise you when you know who Rick Wilson is. Uh, these guys are just freaking just oh, sick people. Politics is run by the just some real slime balls. You know, James Carville for the Democrats, Rick Wilson for the Republicans, James, uh, what's his name, John Weaver. These guys are just real ugly slime balls, man. And uh, they get into politics because that's their only way they can get power. And they get it and they want to yield it. And for some reason, people give them money. It's weird. I just find that strange. Um, all right, my man's got uh, 60% in the uh, bond. Is that BTLX? Is that the long term uh, bond index? I wouldn't have any bonds in my Roth. Tell you that right now. Um, uh, All right. If they can still can't say that, Jake, they can't stay that. Uh, I bought tons of uh, value and COVID tanked the market. Uh, just uh, OK. At least dividends still coming in. That's what I love about dividends. At least they're still coming in, man. Right on. I'm looking for a good six percent dividend yield. They're hard to find. Yep. Uh, I'm selling everything and put into Bitcoin. Uh, all right. Uh, does Vanguard VTSAX and a Roth? Yeah, absolutely. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, locking money in bonds. If you invest in bond mutual fund, can't you purchase and sell? Okay, so Wilma says, all right, so that's a good question. Let's uh, let's go over how this works. Uh, locking money in bonds. If, uh, if, if, uh, if it's a mutual fund, can't you purchase and sell at any time? Absolutely. Absolutely you can. All right, so... The question is, so let's just, I, I just want to reiterate again how bonds work because just because you're in a mutual fund doesn't exclude you from this at all. Um, all right. So we got a bond is issued at a thousand and it matures at a thousand, right? Every single bond is like this. Now, I'm, I, at some point, I think they need to do uh, bonds in perpetuity for the United States. They say we're going to issue 50 or 100 year bonds or just bonds forever that never mature and we'll pay you 2% a year. All right, so that's how it works. So you get a par value at 1,000, uh, which is the issue date right here. And then you get a mature value at 1,000 or par value. All right, and we're just going to use a 2% coupon. All right, 2% coupon. So that means you're getting $20 every single year on this bond. And we'll, we'll just say it's a five-year bond for simple. One, two, three, four, five. All right, so every single year, you're getting $20. You got a 2% coupon. Every single year, you get 20 bucks. So this is a five-year bond. So what? there's only two things that can happen to this bond, two things and two things only. The bond can either go bankrupt or the bond can mature. That's it. It can't do anything else. This is a, a bond is like a CD. It's really like a CD. That's it. It can either go bankrupt, which you lose everything other than whatever the coupon payments you got, or it can uh, or it can mature and you get the par value. So you you loaned the company a thousand. That's your loan amount, a thousand. And then after five years, you get back a thousand. That's that's how it works. And literally, so you're getting your money back. In the interim, the bank or the, the company or the government is giving you $20 a year uh, as a reward for you owning them the money. That's it. So there's only two other things that can happen. They could go bankrupt, which you, which you get zero back, or it could mature at par, which is a thousand. It cannot, it will never mature above par. It will never mature above par. So now what happens is on occasion, a five year bond is not that long, so you won't have a lot of volatility, but on a bond that has a 2% coupon, all right, if if another bond, so let's say now we're in year one of this bond. So now we just cleared one year bond, so we only have four years of coupons left. That's it. But now I can buy another bond. The interest rates go to 1%, all right? Oops. Oh, boy. What's up, gangsta? So now we got the 2% bond. And I got four years left. One, two, three, four, two, 20, 20, 20, 20. 
All right, so now I got a 1% bond, but I got five years at 1%. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. All right, so now we got another. So again, I'm one year into this bond. Now that same company, because interest rates have gone down, have issued me a 1% bond now, all right? So now I'm getting $10 a year on that 1% interest. But I have five years now. I only got four years here. I got five years here for it to mature. So if you were, let's just say you got a raise of 50,000 bucks for simplicity, which bond would cost more? Which bond is more valuable to you? All right. Well, if everything is even, the credit rating agencies, the company and all that is the same. This bond is going to be more expensive because you're getting double the yield. You're getting 20 bucks instead of 10 and you only have four years before it matures. All right. So you're going to say both bonds were issued at $1,000 as a, as the issue, the par value. Both bonds mature at 1000 bucks. But both bonds aren't going to trade at a thousand because this bond inherently is more expensive than this bond because I get double the interest and I only have four years of maturity. So I have one less year of risk for the company to go bankrupt. So I'm going to pay, and there's a there's numbers you can do to see the exact price this bond would be. But let's just say I'm going to pay eleven hundred for this bond. All right. So I'm saying, look, man, I'm not going to pay a thousand. Uh, if I'm paying a thousand for this bond, well, no one's going to sell this to me for a thousand. They're going to sell it to me for eleven hundred. All right, but what does it mature at? What does it mature at? It still matures at a thousand. It still matures at a thousand. So it inherently is going to lose a hundred dollars of cost because it will mature at a thousand. And people think mutual funds because they um, are liquid. Don't follow the same premise. Mutual funds still buy and sell bonds just like that. It doesn't change the facts that bonds have a certain level of, of uh, return that's, that's, that you cannot – it has to be that. It's mathematical. The only way it can't give you that return is if it goes bankrupt. Now, going back to the bonds were up 9% last year, whatever the hell they were. Okay, that's fine. So now we still have – a thousand dollar bond. Let's just say it's up nine percent. So now it's at one thousand ninety. All right. So the bond was up. Is that nine percent? Uh, yeah, right. One thousand ninety. The bond now is selling for a thousand ninety. It's still going to mature at a thousand. It's still going to mature. Someone is going to buy this bond at one ninety, and they're going to they're going to get it back at one thousand. That's inevitable for that to happen. So the question that comes to mind is, if Wilma is going to say, look, man, I want to sell my bonds. Well, you're selling them at a premium, which is fine. But then what are you going to reinvest in it? You're going to reinvest it in other bonds? Well, then you just defeat the purpose. I mean, just you're, you're going to invest them in other bonds that are paying a lower interest rate. So that doesn't make sense. Might as well just keep the bond you already have, unless credit ratings change or something like that. Or you invest in stocks, or you invest in, uh, you pay off debt, one of those things. but you cannot escape from the fact that bonds is, is like clockwork, man. Buy at a thousand, it matures at a thousand. Sometimes it'll go up in price, it will always go back down. There's no getting around it. Somebody is going to lose that $90 capital appreciation, it'll come back to a thousand. It's just all there is to it. Now, as such, it's fine that you got a 9% gain, but to turn around and reinvest in other bonds is silly because you you're just you're you're still in the same situation. Now, what you could do is say, look, man, uh, value stocks are underappreciated. Um, bonds have done a whole lot better than I thought they would, but that's a fleeting return. So let me sell some of my bonds and move it to value stocks. You can make that argument, but then I'd wonder why you're in bonds to begin with. Are you worried in bonds to begin with because you thought the market was going to tank? Has that changed? I don't think it has. Not after last year's return. My goodness. And we still have a pretty uh, hurting economy. So that'd be up for someone to say, I think bond market, I take my gains from the bonds and turn around and invest in stocks. I got no qualm with that as long as someone knows what they're doing. That That's the method of their of what they're trying to accomplish. If they're just saying my bonds are up 9% and I expect that to continue, that's that's just foolhardy. So mutual funds have to, ETFs, they all have to do the same thing. Pension plans, insurance companies. The biggest bond holders are, other than other governments, are pension plans and insurance companies, insurance companies by and large. 
uh, insurance companies, they have to maintain a certain rating for the insurance company in which to make sure uh, that the, the insured, you know, I'm a member of USA. I have life insurance through USA. If I die, I have to make sure that I know that my wife is going to get paid. You see what I'm saying? So I'm not going to buy a fly by night insurance company to insure my life if they're investing in risky crap. I get, they've got to have some stability in their portfolio. Uh, so insurance companies are going to be pretty conservative. They own a lot of bonds because they, and a lot of safe bonds because they got to make sure that they have enough money in which to pay their claimants or their insurance, if that makes sense. So pensions uh, do the same thing. In fact, one of the problems that we had in 2008 was a lot of pensions uh, and insurance companies and endowments uh, as credit rating agencies dropped the bond rates and as prices fell um, uh, to lack of liquidity and stuff, they, they could not by law, by charter, they could not own the bonds. Uh, and again, that's attributed to mark to market accounting, which I won't go into here, but they could, they had to liquid, they had to by law, by their charter, not by law. They had to liquidate their bonds because of, by the rules of their charter said, if a bond drops from A to triple B, can't own it. Now you have all these companies in the same exact boat and they all have to sell. <sighs> Flood in the market out there. They got to sell. When you have that many sellers and there's no buyers, because don't forget the biggest owners of bonds are insurance companies and pension companies other than in governments. Well, these are also the both sides of the trades for by and large, the bond buyers, the bond traders are the same people. So now they're all flooding the market with the sell side. There's no one on the other side, no one on the other side. So the prices are dropping and dropping and dropping because they get all these people. The more the price drops, the more the bonds lost their credit agents, the ratings, <laughs> which meant the more they had to flood the market. It was insane. All because of government policies. Yay for government there to rescue us. Uh, yeah, the point being is bonds are, I, I don't like bonds. I, I'm telling you right now, I think bonds are silly. You shouldn't own them by and large. There are reasons to own them. I like Jenny May. Um, but generally speaking, in this loan interest rate environment, you know, I was like just being cash, man. You know what I'm saying? A high yield savings account, share certificate account at the local credit union. Bonds don't do that much for you right now. They just don't. Now, with that said, I said that last year and I got uh, egg on my face because bonds were up 9% or whatever the hell they were. Okay. I just, I'm just telling you right now, uh, it doesn't take a rocket science to see what happened to, uh, I don't think, to BND. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to BND, but let's look at, wait, hold on a sec. Yeah. All right. And there's, there's BND right there. And so you can see the, you know, the price of uh, the bond market index fell from 88. And what's that? Uh, 8849 uh, in December to uh, 80, uh, 87. And uh, so it basically fell two bucks, eh, not much, but two bucks in the last three months. Um, and that's BND, which has some corporate bonds in there too. And if we just look at the, the 30 year treasury, um, Yeah, so if this is a 30 year, let's just the three month, of, that's a that's a yield on the 30 year treasury. The yield on the 30 year treasury, you see a jump like that, that means the bonds work as a seesaw, so the price has dropped at this, the corresponding the yield going up. It's uh it's uh it's been it's been tough out there for sure. All right, let's see what else we got here. Um uh yeah, Jeannie May. I, I just I love Jeannie May. Jeannie May is uh is three to five years, you know, I, I still say have some cash, you know, you want some cash with the bank, Charles, but Jenny, man, I'm a huge fan, man, huge fan. I'm a, yeah, I'm a Repub I'm a libertarian who votes Republican, uh, other than I voted libertarian in 1996 for Harry Brown, uh, and I campaigned for him. I voted for Steve Forbes in 2000 because of flat tax, even though he was Republican. Um, uh, 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 and I voted, I, did I vote? I don't think I even voted. I think I voted for Libertarian in 2008 because I could not stand McCain. I like Sarah Palin, but I did not like McCain. And then, uh, yeah, but you know, the Libertarian now, Joe Jorgensen, I mean, she's a freaking idiot, dude. I, I'm sorry. Libertarian is trying, they, I just, if my man Dave Smith takes over the Libertarian Party, I, I might be willing to go back. Um, 
Uh, I like Dave Smith a lot. I do not like the con current contingents of libertarians, not in the least. Uh, Joe Jorgensen, I certainly didn't like Gary. I get, when Gary Johnson was a Republican governor of New Mexico advocating for legalizing marijuana back in the 90s uh, in school vouchers, I, that was, I loved that. And then I don't know what happened to him and certainly Bill Weld. Uh, uh, libertarian, why would you let these clowns, these are grifters, man. Gary Johnson, maybe not, but Bill Weld, he's not a libertarian. He's a liberal Republican. I just, what the hell? Piss me off. Uh, so grifters, grifters always go to the Libertarian Party uh, because it's easy to conquer it because the other people are idiots like Joe Jorgensen. What, are, what the hell? That's uh, just stupid. And I, I just don't get it. So anyway, Libertarians got nothing for me. Um, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens to Trumpster. But anyway, I'm Republican by default because the Libertarians are so idiotic. And I'm still, uh, uh, I, I got to tell you, though, uh, I'm losing a lot of my Libertarian uh, street cred in my own head because uh, um I remember in 1998 when uh, Clinton's DOJ and Eric Holder was the attorney, the assistant attorney general, by the way, under uh, Janet Reno. And he was a clown back then. He's a bigger clown. It's, I mean, the guy, I don't know why he's not in jail, but he never will be because the Democrats control uh, the left controls everything in the swamp. But anyway, long story short, the DOJ went after Microsoft uh, for a monopoly on the Netscape. Uh, remember, the, uh, they, they basically got rid of Netscape on their uh, browser on the, on the uh, I think it was like Windows 95 or something like that. It's crazy. And I remember thinking, this is violation, you know, blah, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. You shouldn't, you know, Microsoft's a private company. They should blah, blah, blah. And I tell you, man, um, I, I look now and I'm saying, woo, how wrong I was because now we got monopolies. Do you know that Google Play and Apple control 99%, 99% of, uh, of the app stores, 99%. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's collusion. Absolutely. That's monopolistic. Absolutely. Without question. And then on top of that, Amazon is, is absolutely, uh, a monopoly without question. And, and that the, the point being is that, um, it, it used to be the day where I said private corporations will fix itself and they can't. And some guy said a good point today. He goes, you know, it's funny, all these guys saying the internet, um, all these internet companies or companies that use the internet, Amazon, uh, private business, private business, Twitter, internet, private business, private business. But the the chassis of the internet was on taxpayer money. So what the hell? So uh, the government is funding uh, a lot of these companies anyway with uh, significant, significant services, Amazon, Twitter. Uh, and yet, and also the internet was built with a lot of government money. And these same companies who are using taxpayer dollars are banning uh, groups like Parler, which is freaking insane. That's, and never mind, just President Trump, the whole thing's nuts. It's funny too, because uh, apparently there's, I saw this thing, they said, huh, all the calls for activity on the Capitol Hill insurrection, uh, none of it was on Parler. It was on Facebook and it was on uh, uh, Gmail, Facebook, Gmail, and was the other one there too, Twitter. Uh, <laughs> so all the calls for rebellious activities, it wasn't on Parler, it was on those other three things. And somehow Parler is the one. Anyway, so my uh, my disdain of big business is uh, is 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 worse as ever been. Even though I was from the left, grown up on the left, big time. Um, I never thought corporations would be the enemy to, that you couldn't trust. I always thought it was going to be government. Turns out it's not government; it's corporations, and uh, which is crazy. Never would have thought that. So, going back to what I read earlier today with Deidre McCloskey, um, the, the merchants. The entrepreneurs, the smaller business class, the local chamber of commerce, not the U.S. chamber of commerce. They can all kiss my big fat behind. The local businesses and merchants and entrepreneurs, small business, the tinkerers in your garage. That is where freedom comes from. It doesn't come from big business. It certainly doesn't come from the U.S. chamber. And now U.S. chamber of commerce is saying they're not going to I just they can all kiss my butt. So I'm very much looking forward to a, uh, a populist movement that's going to come from whatever the Republican Party decides to do with a Trumpster. Uh, I was uh, I, I had heard I knew it was fake, but I had heard that Mitch McConnell was furious because Fox News reported sources tell Fox News that Mitch McConnell wants to impeach Trump. And I said and I couldn't believe how many people on the right believe that crap. I said, would you uh, if there's anything we've learned you can't trust any of these news sources. But I was right. I tell you, man, if Mitch McConnell would have voted to impeach Trump, I'd, I'd be Republican Party would be dead to me. 
uh, you know, these 10 idiots who voted for him are stupid. I get it. They just, I don't know what the hell's going on, but that's not enough to make me lose my faith in the Republican party. But I'll tell you, man, if Mitch McConnell, um, who's some of those, other, Ben Sass, uh, Mittens, you know, there's a few in there that are scumbags, but by and large, the Republican party is a hell of a lot more righteous than it was back in the day of a new Gingrich and those guys. Um, you know, cause those guys changed the minute they got into power, they changed, man. Scarborough, John Kasich, the list goes on and on, man. These guys who came in there, you know, guns, guns blazing. Then the minute they saw the big money of sucking off the, uh, the teat of the government, uh, they, they became big shills for big government programs and they can all kiss my butt too. Sad, man. Um, it's horrible. And I'll never forget Newt Gingrich sitting on the bench with Nancy Pelosi talking about climate change. You're freaking, you just, I like Newt Gingrich. He had a conversion to Catholicism that seems to have, you know, given him some spark lately. But you can't, you cannot negotiate with these people, man. You can't. You can't. And it's always on their terms. And you cannot negotiate climate change because it'll never work. It'll never be enough. I don't understand why Republicans can't understand this. That guy, Matt Gates in Florida, lots of Republicans love him. He's a big freaking softy when it comes to climate change. I'm telling you, and you, you can't have that. CO2 is not bad. It's just not. The idea that fossil fuels are bad is immoral to make that argument, man. And if any Republican doesn't pull their head out of their butt and recognizes that fossil fuels, there's a moral argument to be made for fossil fuels. In fact, I got a book on there. Uh, let's see if I can't find it. Oh, man. Uh, anyway. Uh, there's some place. Uh, it's on there someplace, the, uh, but my man, uh, Alex Epstein, the moral argument for fossil fuels. And uh, if Republicans, you know, freaking can't re recognize that, they can all kiss my butt. But I, I think we have a pretty good movement coming up because Trump lit a fire on our butts. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I, I will tell you, though, it depends on what the Senate does. If they try to vote to impeach Trump after he leaves and the Republicans go along for it, oh, huh, man. They can all kiss my butt. But unfortunately, the libertarian isn't the place to go um, unless Dave Smith takes that over or someone who's righteous. Uh, you got it, James. Uh, anyone who's a millionaire but wants a job for 175 is kind of fishy. Yeah, but Eric, the, the, you, you, they're not going for the 175 job. They're going for the power and all the uh, – uh, uh, they're going, they're going for the uh, the power and all the, uh, you know, what comes after that congressional run. You know what I'm saying? Well, why, how is it that Harry Reid, who is that reading about? Paul Ryan has, a, uh, he went into uh, D.C. as a pauper. And now he's got a net worth of nearly $10 million. Harry Reid, same thing. It's old freaking Steely Joe. Not only Steely Joe, but his freaking, uh, his kid, old Hunter. Crazy. Um uh, Uh, yeah, uh, Bill Barr, we're talking about the, uh, the real Bill Barr who used to represent this district actually in Georgia, uh, not the guy in the DOJ. Um, uh, he had some good things. He, he seemed to go a little bit off the reservation. Some things I forgot what it was. I can't remember, but no, I, I, I would, uh, I'd, I'd take Bill Barr. Absolutely. The, the, the good Bill Barr. Um, all right, so uh, Jesse says, make a list of book recommendations. Yeah, man, absolutely. The first one is always Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, for sure, is always the first one. Uh, oh, yeah. And then, of course, you got some Hayek, uh, Individualism and Economic Order. To be honest with you, I haven't really read this much. This has been sitting here on my what's called an anti-library, the books I got to read that I haven't read. I've read this a million times. This is easy. Man. I mean, this is an easy book to read right here. Um, uh, but you should always start, and I don't have it up here, with uh, C.S. Lewis's screw tape letters. Always start with C.S. Lewis screw tape letters uh, because that's uh, that's the foundation for everything. Other than the um, other than this right here, the good book. All right. Um, Ah, Jill, you're all right. Jill says, I'm not optimistic. Ah, you'll be all right. Trust me. 
two years from now, it's going to be a whole – I mean, it's either going to be – look, I was listening to AOC today talk about how Ted Cruz and uh, Hawley need to resign because AOC says it. That we want them out exposed. I'm telling you, the best thing that ha- – because <laughs> Republicans still have a majority of state legislatures, but a lot more than Democrats. It's a 50-50 split in the Senate. All right, they only got a what five or ten seat majority in the House. It's not two thousand and nine. It's not nineteen ninety three. And and yet the Democrats have gone so much farther left. They think it's they think it is. And I'm just telling you, um, it's not. And uh, <laughs> I I love a Democratic Party uh, with that with that sliver of a majority acting crazy. I just love it. I think it's great. I think it's going to be fun to watch. It's like watching California. I mean, California is going to fall off into the sea, man, uh, because they're they're nuts. Because the the one party state is it's just they're dumb, just not very bright people. And as such, it's going to be fun watching them trying to govern. I can't wait to watch it. That's going to suck. I mean, you know, get around it. You get the thing that sucks most. And this is what what I've done now is uh, I I I I got rid of my Safari uh, browser on this. I went to Brave. You know what I'm saying? And then when I started going through um, my uh, my my bookmarks, I got rid of the ones that pissed me off. Breitbart, I like Breitbart, but every time I read it, I get mad. I said I just gotta I gotta get rid of it. It doesn't make me happy. You see what I'm saying? And I don't want to be ignorant, but I still use, you know, my number one source is always uh, is always Instapundit here. Um, if I can find it. Uh, oh, check this out. And where's Instapundit? All right, but check this out right here. My man, uh, who sent this to me? Uh, Doug, Dougie Fresh. Uh, check this out. Illinois to withhold federal tax breaks. Um, I always get a kick out of these guys. Um, did you see the one with half Whitmer? And they had a they, <laughs> they had a screenshot of the lady with an L and pointed at half Whitmer. It was awesome. Uh, Governor Clowney says he uh, he's going to withhold. Federal COVID-19 relief funds from small businesses to help fix the state budget. Um, Congress approved federal tax relief to help businesses recover some losses during the pandemic. But the governor announced he could suspend those tax breaks in Illinois. Tax breaks? (laughs) To still and still require business to pay. Uh, The head of the Illinois Chamber of Commerce warned that that could make it tougher for small business to survive. This is tax relief for the hardest hit small businesses in the nation that was enacted in Washington to go to them on a bipartisan basis. So that's actual money in their pockets that allows them to go and ahead and compensate for the fact that they don't have customers right now because of government dictate. But the good governor says, unfortunately, COVID has also hit our state budget, requiring tough choices about what we can and cannot afford. Right now, we cannot afford to expand tax breaks to businesses that have already received tax breaks. Well, isn't that interesting? Because that's not from uh, uh, that is not from you. Is from the federal government. So uh, that's that's the uh, Illinois never change, man. That's that's just uh, uh, crazy. All right, so let's see what else we got on the the docket here for other articles. Uh, just get the hell out of Illinois if you're still in Illinois. What the hell are you doing? I, I look, man, it's, it's crazy. All right, and I want to show you. This is fun. This oops. This is a good article. But I hate fossil fuels, Josh. Well, how are you going to heat your house there, sister? Well, with solar. I'm going to heat it with solar because it's a peak oil. We have peak oil. We're running out. Um, and we got right here, Exxon's mega oil finds in Guana are just beginning. Like many global oil majors, ExxonMobil is under considerable pressure because of the significant fallout from COVID. Actually, I think this might be one of the reasons why the stock is up so much. Uh, there are growing fears that Exxon, because of its tremendous debt burden, is a zombie company. These are generally companies that are not generating sufficient income to cover their interest expenses, i.e. the federal government, uh, if they raise rates. While Exxon is struggling because of prolonged slump in the oil prices, they report a $2.4 billion loss for the first nine months of 2020. The global oil super major has several levers at its disposal to boost profitability. Uh, let's see. In response to sh- sharply weaker oil prices and the need to boost profitability, it announced that it intended to prioritize capital spending for v- high-value assets, key among them uh, being its operations in this place, offshore South America. 
It made its first discovery in the, the, the Stabroic block during May 2015. By 2019, the integrated energy major had commenced production at the Lisa oil field to pump 120,000 uh, barrels a day. Uh, made its 18th oil discovery there and upgraded its estimate of recoverable oil resources to more than 8 billion barrels. Uh, that month, it announced it will uh, develop uh, another oil field in this, that block, which will come online in 2024, possessing the capacity to pump 220,000 barrels a day. By December 2020, it achieved its production goal for the Lisa field and it anticipates producing more than 750,000 barrels a day. This is a highly profitable asset for the integrity integrated oil company, even with weaker oil prices. According to his partner, Hess, which has 30% interest, uh, the Lisa oil field is pumping crude at a break-even price of 35 per barrel, and this will fall further. Uh, that's all good. Exxon secured a, set, uh, a favorable production sharing of, uh, let's see, anyway, uh, no, right here. There are further indications that this is merely the start of what become a vast oil boom that will benefit not only Exxon and Guana, but neighboring Suriname, Saran, I don't know what it's called. During 2020, it announced that uh, with Malaya's National Oil Company that the hydrocarbons have been discovered uh, here. Blah, 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 blah. It indicates the discovery holds considerable potential, especially when considered that Block 52 borders Block 58 where Apache and Total made three significant oil discoveries in 2020. Uh, in the U.S. in 2019, the U.S. Geological, uh, Ge Geological Survey stated it was looking to survey blah, 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 and it had undiscovered resources of 15, barrels of 15 billion barrels of crude and 42 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Oh, take that, Greta. To put that on your peace pipe and smoke it while you're freaking using hydrocarbons and you're using fossil fuels. They can all kiss my butt. I could not be happier. I love it. I could not be happier. Um, and I'm just going to, if I see if I can't find this article, I'm not sure if I still have it. Hold on just a second. Uh, uh, do I got this article? Hold on, energy you know? note. I bet I don't. Ah, geez, Louise. Geez, Louise. I want this USGS article from last year. Um, uh, right here. There we go. Let's check this out. I think this is it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's check this. This is one of them from USGS. I put it in the wrong bookmark area. All right. So share screen. Because remember, uh, Biden is going to get rid of fossil fuels. Uh, USGS, Appalachian form Formation uh, hold estimate 214. <laughs> the Marcella Shale and Utica Shale Formations of the Appalachian Basin hold an estimated 214 uh, trillions at cubic feet of undiscovered, technically recoverable, continuous resources of natural gas. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the Marcellus Point Pleasant Utica extends to part of Kentucky, Maryland, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia. The new numbers, about 97 uh, trillion uh, cubic feet of gas, in a, you saw it, represent large increases from previous assessments. Uh, both formations in 2011, it estimated a mean of 84 trillion cubic feet. And then uh, the... Uh, <laughs> If only stupid Cuomo would get the hell out of New York and let my people uh, in Maine get some freaking natural gas. Um, oh, that just makes me so happy. All these fools, but trust the experts, Josh. The experts know, and we're at peak oil. They keep saying that. Now they don't say peak oil the way they used to. Now they're saying uh, it's just the whole thing. These guys are full of crap. They don't know what the other talk about. It's so easy to say peak oil uh, right here. Let's watch this one right here. Is this the geological? Oh, here's another one. Oh man, I, I could I could read these all day long. I love it because all these guys are full of crap. They don't know what the hell they're talking about, and it is fun to throw stones. America's oil and gas reserves double with massive new Permian uh, uh, discovery, and this is in 2018. Notice 18, 19, and 20 huge discoveries. America, USGS published an assessment of continuous uh, uh, resource in the part of prolific Permian oil and gas basin. Uh, located in the Wolf Camp Shale and overlying Bone Spring Formation, 
Uh, the unproven technically recoverable reserves are officially the largest on the planet. But curiously, this story isn't making waves in the mainstream media. Located in the Wolf Camp Shale and overlying Bone Spring Formation, the unproven technically recoverable reserves are officially the largest on the flipping planet. Nearly one third of U.S. crude comes from the Permian, making the largest shale oil producing region in the country. While numerous studies have been conducted in the Permian's half dozen sub basins and their many overlapping formations, this represents the first comprehensive USGS assessment of continuous resources in Wolf Camp within the Delaware Basin. And the findings are truly incredible. Estimates 46 billion barrels of oil, 280 trillion cubic feet of gas, 20 billion barrels of natural gas liquids are trapped in these low permeability shale formations. To better understand just how staggering these numbers are, think about it like this. At the end of 2017, total U.S. proven reserves of crude hovered around 40 billion barrels. Total hovered around 40 billion barrels. For natural gas, figures stood around 465 trillion. And just this one discovery alone, oh my God, that doesn't make your heart pump and say, glory to God, man, nothing will. Oh, I love it. I could not be happier. And uh, there's so much to be happy about because no matter what, energy makes the country run. We don't have energy. Nothing happens. Even freaking Steely Joe knows that, man. I'm just telling you right now. Do not worry. I mean, look, they're going to come up with stupid stuff. I get it. They're going to put a freaking price on carbon. It's stupid. Uh, they can all kiss my butt for that. But uh, uh, let's see. I want to see if I can find the one from USGS, though. Uh, I don't think that's it. Yeah, actually, this is fun. Though. I, just while we're on the uh, going off on this, I always like this one. I haven't found, I haven't seen it for a couple of days, for a couple uh, about a year. Um, so if you, if I always say, if you don't like, uh, you can't be green and fly. Can't fly and be green. Traveling by airplane produces significant greenhouse gas emissions. So if we take a flight from JFK to London Heathrow, uh, we're going to say 2017 global average. The round trip flight from New York to London is 7,040 miles, produces 2.1 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions for each passenger, not the whole flight, for each passenger. In 2017, <laughs> 81 countries in the world have lower annual per capita emissions than just this one flight. Did you hear that? In 2017, 81 countries in the world have lower annual per capita emissions than this one flipping flight, which accounts for almost 50% of the world's population. So by you sitting in business class, smarty farty Michael Mann at Penn State University telling the world how dangerous climate change is, going to England, never mind Australia, from freaking Philadelphia, you being on that flight, alone right there accounts for more than almost half the population's entire emissions. That one flight. Isn't that crazy? I wonder if we can go to Australia. Let's see if we can't go to Australia because uh, that's where Michael Mann was doing a uh, – is it Sydney? Oh, right there, Sydney. Yeah, I saw it. Sydney. Oh, man, Sydney. Right there. Let's see how much this is because that's where Michael Mann was giving a speech a couple years ago. The round-trip flight from New York to Sydney is 20,000 miles. And it produces 6.6 .6 tons of CO2 equivalent emissions for each passenger. In 2017, 128 countries in the world have lower annual per capita emissions uh, than this one flight, accounting for 65% of the population. You will have more emissions on that one flight than 65% of the population of the course of the world, of the course of the year. You, my friend, if you're claiming CO2 is deadly and are on that flight, are a scumbag. That's all there is to it. But, Josh, I only fly from New York to Boston. That's all I do because I'm Sniffy Joe. That's all I do. We got Boston Logan. All right, let's take a look. So right here, eight. this one flight, this one flight, 18 countries in the world have lower annual per capita emissions than this one flight. I used to fly from Atlanta to Boston six times, seven, probably eight times a year. Uh, that's from Atlanta. And so let's just see what that would do here. Um, go to Atlanta. We'll say, uh, what's Atlanta's, uh, I forgot what the, 
Ah, Hartsville, that's what it is. So I do, so I do this. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I did this probably eight times, probably more than that. But anyway, still, uh, every flight, 49 countries, 17% of the population, and less emissions in, than me in that one flight round trip. Yeah, put down your peace pipe and smoke it and greenies because you're all fake. Fake news, fake news. Uh, it's just, it's all fake, man. Uh, they can all kiss my big, fat, shiny behind. All right, so, uh, uh, so ooh, real quick, I want to show you guys just what I got you. Still got 174 people on here. I'm just going to go through my screen here. Um, I was talking to a guy the other day, or a lady, I should say, and uh, she raises up in Maine, up in the great state of Maine, uh, a beef critter, which I assume is a cow, and uh, three pigs. And my man um, right here, Darby uh, Simpson is this guy's name, or right here, Darby Simpson, uh, grass-fed uh, – I'm drawing a blank with his uh, name of his website is grass fed. I can't remember. But anyway, here's a course on God of raising pigs like a farmer and rolling course for 39 bucks. Um, and he's in Indiana up your neck of the woods, Jill. Uh, I forgot exactly where he is in Indiana, but he's in the middle of the state someplace. I do know that. Like here's Indianapolis. He's down here someplace. Um, our, so anyway, if I, I think one of the things we got to start realizing is that you're going to have to learn to be more self-sufficient in producing your own food. Uh, it's wonderful in this regard from a pure financial planning perspective because there's no sales tax because you cut your own food and eat it. These people up in Maine, you know, they, they raise the cow, they raise the pigs, they take it to the butcher, and it costs about 3000 bucks all in, but they got enough meat for the whole year and way more. They give it to the church, they give it to the community, uh, and it's basically 3000 bucks for meat. All year. You know what I'm saying? I said that, and it's good. It's good meat. They know the chemicals that go in there. Ain't none. It's grass-fed. Nothing better than grass-fed beef, man. Uh, it's fresh. They raise it. They raise it right. They raise it humanely, and uh, and they're employing their butcher, butcher too. And it's, I think it's just – like I don't know anything about raising pigs. I'm going to learn, though. I tell you right now, I already told my, my better half. I said – you know, when we're done here, we're going to go back. I used to, we used to have chickens when I was a kid. I, I don't really, I don't know how to do it, but I'm going to learn because the idea of creating your own food supply, uh, keeping it cost down because 3000 bucks for a year's meat is pretty freaking cheap. When you think about it, no sales tax on that. You see what I'm saying? And on top of that, you don't have to worry about transportation costs. You, I mean, you just, it's all, it's all there. Self-sufficient, man. And then you can barter if you need to with other people who might raise kale. I like kale. Then you can barter. I mean, it's all kinds of things to do. Anyway, so I'll put the link right here because uh, I, I like Darby. I'm going to interview him. One of these days, I'm going to interview him for the show because uh, uh, he had a, uh, a workshop um, in in Indiana a couple years ago that I was gonna, me and Chloe were going to go to, but uh, uh, we could just never make it happen. So I asked him, I said, you still doing your workshops? And he's not because they're too much of a pain. But he said, maybe I'll do it like a one day a week thing. So. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, that'd be good, man. I, uh, buying one half cow in March right there, right there. says my man, uh, Eric, absolutely. Dude, I still got my man. Jordan sold me uh, a quarter cow and I'm still eating. It's freaking and I, now my sous vide, that Chuck roast, I, the marinade I used the other day was not good. That kind of sucked. But, uh, sous vide, you sous vide, even with Chuck roast, it's like, like Chuck roast. Oh, oh, it's like cocaine for the mouth, dude. You're like, oh. Put me. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, I need to raise livestock. I look, man, I, there's a guy, there's a, oops, there's a guy in here. Uh, is he on here who raises pigs in Iowa? I don't see him here. Not today though, but, uh, yeah, right on go Maine. Yeah. It's, uh, let me find his website, Jeremy. It's, uh, Grass fed. Uh, and Darby's a good guy. Grass fed. Yeah, right here. Grass fed. I think it's this. Hold on a second. Before I tell you, uh, let's make sure it's Darby. And he and Diego, uh, I forgot Diego's last name. They do a podcast as well. Diego Footer, that's what it is. Uh, Diego Footer. Uh, here is, they do a podcast. Yeah. Um, Uh, yeah, grass fed life right here. Uh, so it's grass fed life. Uh, there's Darby right there, and there's a uh, uh, Diego Footer. <laughs> uh, they do a podcast, good stuff. Um, 
uh, grassfedlife.co, start your farm now, P- pasture poultry, start your profitable mini farm. Oh, it just, it's, oh, this is a, this is a fantastic big fan. Courses are, are not very expensive. Uh, listen to past episodes. A big fan of these guys. Um, uh, Diego's out of California. Don't make a costly mistake with a butcher. This this is I actually signed up for that because I want to read it. Look, I'm not doing anything until we got the suburbs. I'm in an HOA, but uh, this is this is big on my list. I'm talking to these folks up in Maine, and they were just you know the the husband was a pastor. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he wasn't it wasn't anything, and and she just they just look at they said we're going to learn how to do it, and they did um, on a farm up in Maine. And uh, pff, hell, anyone can do it. You know what I'm saying? It's great. And, uh, you know, they're not making bank. They don't need to make bank because they're living cheap. I think that's the thing we got to get back to, just living cheap. Not living cheap like you're not spending on anything. I, you know, I'm not being stoic or miserly, but let's live a little bit cheaper, man. You know what I'm saying? I think it's important. And I uh, I think we're going to have to anyway because I do think there's going to be some uh, some stuff here in uh, – coming down the pike with shortages and whatnot with uh, with Steely Joe because they don't know how to run the economy. I mean, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I mean, she's just not a bright lady, uh, but she thinks she is. That's the worst case. And when you think you're smart, you're not that smart. And you think with government control, if we just tell people how to live, they'll do it. That's nuts, man. So, um, yeah, right on, Eric. Uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going to – I don't know. Um I'd like to get back to Northeast. I'm not going to lie to you. I miss it. And I know it's easy to say when I'm sitting in Georgia in the cold, but uh, um, I I just, you know, I haven't been in Maine since I was 14 years old. I was, you know, living there. And uh, when I was working in Portsmouth, New Hampshire for a couple, uh, about almost a year, um, I I, I was able to deal with the winter. It's crazy. I couldn't believe it. And because I was prepared for it. So I miss that. So, you know, I don't know. But I got to tell you, Virginia is four seasons. And my wife's from Virginia. We met in Virginia. Three of our four were born in Virginia. We lived in Virginia for eight years on top of um, when we, you know, I just, Virginia has a lot going for it as well. Um, the politics are, you know, the, the, the state is run by libs from northern Virginia down to Richmond. But on that, the state is right wing. So they, uh, the Charlottesville, you know, whatever. But you know, if you're out in Western Virginia, no one cares. You're, you're, you're going to, no one's going to be up your butt. Um, and it's a good, it's just good community. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm looking for. It's just, I, I got to get out of the suburbs. I, I've come to that conclusion. The suburbs, um, it's just, it's, you know, just got these uh, HOAs and stuff. And, you know, I like my neighbors. Hell, I'm on the freaking HOA, if you can believe that. <sighs> but uh, I just, it's, it's, uh, I miss, you know, the community. And I will tell you, the New Jersey, when we lived in Hatterfield, I loved it, man. It was great. Other than New Jersey is insane. But uh, our neighbors were just it's just like the old days. Everybody walked. You know what I'm saying? You, you went over to your neighbor's house. We all hang around Fourth of July. It was just it was fun. Had a Marine Corps colonel next to me, a guy from the CIA next to him, a guy that, you know next to him. You see what I'm saying? Just all just everyone helped each other out. It was great. It was, it was fantastic. And um, it was fun, man. So I, I, I miss that community. In the suburbs, you don't really get that as much, I found. Um, where just because everyone takes cars, you know what I'm saying? There's not that much walking. Uh, everyone takes cars and stuff, and uh, everyone's kind of ex- uh, secluded. And, uh, um, you know, if you're, I'm 50, and so maybe young folks today don't know that um, in terms of, uh, especially if you live in your suburbs your whole life, but, you know, just walk outside and, you know, see neighbors uh, walk around and hanging out. And kid, I just, I, that's, you don't get that in the suburbs as much as you used to, if that makes sense. And I, I think that's, uh, that leaves a lot to be desired. So we'll figure it out. At the end of the day, it sounds good to, but the cold is, the cold scares me, man. That's all there is to it. Uh, you know, when I was growing up and going home after school and on Peaks Island, and open up the door just all every day is like a, uh, is it going to be colder inside or outside? And my stomach would turn because it's like, if I got to go home and it's colder inside the house and outside, um, you just like, what do you do? You know what I'm saying? It's like the scariest flipping thing, man. You, you're walking home. Your mom's, my mom worked part-time up in Portland. So you're walking home after school and uh, it's, you know, it's Maine in the wintertime, a little bit cold. And you open the door, and there's no heat in the house, it, it, and it just uh, and you open there, and it's colder inside than outside, which means you can't escape the cold because inside is colder than it is outside. And yeah, you can put a, a you know blanket on and stuff, but it's not it's not it's not warmth. 
it's not. It's uh, I can't explain it. It's scary. You know what I'm saying? And uh, because your home is where you escape the elements. And when you're outside, you're in the elements. When you're inside is where you go to escape it. When you're outside and you go inside, it's worse. Then you're you're kind of stuck. And then uh, that, so that scares the living hell out of me, not going to lie, being cold. And uh, that might just be post-traumatic stress or something. I don't know. But, man, but then again, the heat of the deep south in the summertime, oh, pains me, pains me. So we'll figure it out. It's all good. Uh, it always depends where the kids go. Uh, we know, and we got four kids. Imagine at some point I have grandkids. You know, if they're uh, if they're in San Diego, and I want to go back to New England. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> depends on where the B and C wants to go. The ball and chain. Uh, what to do with five hundred cash? I, man, I don't know, brother. That's uh, yes. Uh, I, yes, I saw uh, that clown with his freaking you know, homeless beard. Uh, I wonder if he's worried about, I tell you, activist shareholders. It's funny how much I've come around. A good friend of mine is a uh, is an ambulance chaser, and uh, he made a point. He said, Josh, look, I know everyone hates us, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like short sellers. We are here to keep people who run amok at bay. And yes, people take advantage of that. Uh, uh, the activist shareholders are the same thing, man. And, uh, you know, they do hold accountability to, uh, tyrants like Jack Dorsey and whatnot. And I just wonder if, uh, uh, I wonder if old Jack is scared crapless because Tumblr, uh, whatever Tumblr, what the hell's Tumblr? Twitter, Twitter stock is tumbling. What the hell is Tumblr? Is it Tumblr and, uh, Twitter? No. Anyway, I wonder if he's, uh. Uh, if he's scared crapless because it's tumbling, he's like, holy crap, we're going to get sued. I, I Look, I got no – whatever Elizabeth Warren does, that faker, I got no I, – I don't care. I, literally, I've checked out of caring about corporate America anymore. They can all kiss my big fat behind because uh, they didn't do anything uh, for all these years. And now Verizon, did you see Verizon? We're not going to donate to anyone on the right side who uh, – just the whole thing. These guys are nuts. They think they're going to get – it's, it's 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 like the Mensheviks, man. They think they're going, or they, even the Social Democrats, they think they're going to get safe passage, and the commies are gonna get you. They're gonna get you, and they're gonna get you. And uh, I don't know what this is with corporate America thinking they can make deals with the devil. The Republicans need to wake their big fat behinds up and say we've sold our souls to protect corporate America, and they're not returning the favor. I'm like, dude, how? I mean, they are returning the favor. That's the problem. There are some individual Republicans who get paid. And just look at Fannie Mae from the old days. I'm telling you, look at Fannie Mae. The reason Fannie Mae couldn't be reined in is because they bought enough Republicans to keep the regulations at bay. Friggin' scumbags. And so what happens is you got enough Republicans that get paid by corporate America to not go after these people. And uh, I just I hope the MAGA revolution takes over the GOP and kicks Liz Cheney's and her kind out and never to be seen again because they are there to protect corporate America at their self-interest, but not for the benefit of America. No way. There's no way that Twitter should be a free reign to, to there's just no way this cannot happen. And I hope it, look, the Republicans don't have the gumption. I hope the Democrats do. And I will laugh, but Josh, you don't know what happens later on. I, I get it. We, I've heard that for so long. I just, at this, I just don't care. I've heard that for, but Josh, if they break up AT and T, but Josh, if they you know break up Microsoft or force Microsoft to carry Net uh, Netscape, but Josh, it's always it's it's always I don't care. The corporations have done us nothing. They can all kiss my behind. Uh, going after Trump is the last straw for me. That's the president of the United States. And if you read what he said, he didn't incite people. I'm sorry. I, if you think he's incited people, then you you're going in there trying to prove he incited people, and he did. And it's just as stupid. And and I just. It, and the whole thing is insane, especially after all the crap this summer that Kamala, Biden, Pelosi, all these scumbags said to Antifa and BLM. Also, now Trump's a bad guy. He's the president of the frippin' United States. It's not even Trump they're going after. They're going after all. Yeah, I'm pissed off, man. Um, uh, Newsom's diverting gas tax funds to climate change initiatives. Jeez uh, Louise. Yeah, I uh, I see the problem with the Bernie. Bernie is a faker. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, uh, 
Bernie's a big fat faker. The the problem is there is some uh, common ground with some of his supporters, though, if that makes sense. And I think at the end of the day, if we could get rid of the leadership that's kind of throwing, I don't know. I, I actually think a lot of Bernie bros are uh, are knee deep okay with Trump. I really do. I'm not knee deep okay with Bernie because he's a faker, man. Um, I think a lot of the Bernie bros though, would would say if you gave him a true serum that they're okay with Trump. And I think there's some common ground there for sure. The good, the, the old hippie-ish Bernie bros, not the Antifa crazies. I actually think there's something to be said about uh, you know some of those Occupy Wall Street folks, um, and who who kind of gone to the Bernie Bro side, but they're not Antifa. I, I think there's a lot of common ground, and we we shall see. All right, my friends, been on here for almost two hours. I'm gonna get off here. I don't think I've had my hot tea yet, man. Yes, corporate America, right on. Jesse is trying to be young and hip, and it's embarrassing. Sad thing is, the young people they just they're supposed to rebel, and yet they're like. Yes, sir, Fauci, I will do what you say because I'm a Maoist. I'm a Red Guard. Yes, sir, Fauci. All right, my friends, we will uh, we will see you later. Appreciate it, and uh, appreciate y'all being on here. Hang tight, and Jill, don't get too worried out there. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. We survived worst. We'll survive here. <laughs>